bad things of the body, but he also laid out uh, the good things of the heart and the spirit. And he contrasted verses 8, so verses 5, down through uh, verse 9. And then in verse 10 uh, on, he starts to say the, 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 the blessing or the parts that we're supposed to act like. And then he, then he gets down into verse uh, 14 and he says, And beyond all, beyond all these things, put on love, the perfect bond of unity. In verse 15, And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. All right. Verse 14. I'm sorry, verse 15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. What is that? What is the peace of Christ? We talked about this a little bit last week. You could also say the peace of being in Christ, right? Or the peace that Christ exhibited. Let that rule in your hearts. But if that rules in your hearts, you don't have other space for other things, correct? If something is ruling something, that means it's dominating it. So the peace of Christ is what needs to dominate us. So what, what does that mean? I mean nothing touchy-feely stuff. I mean, just tell me, what does a peace of Christ entail? What does it, what does it mean to you to have a peace in Christ? Well, you just got through with the verse that you said. Such positive things as people should, as we should have in our minds. The kind of people that uh, we should be. We, we should take it to heart to make our lives that kind. Then he comes to this. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. He's saying, let all of these things, which is peace, which is health, which is... Uh, I always uh, identified the uh, peace is without war. And so with all these things that you just mentioned, and then you come to this verse, let those things be part of your life. Yes. Now, this doesn't say only when it's convenient, does it? This means that any Christian, any follower of Christ, must always be what?
kids know that they that she loved them, but until they had children themselves, they never would really understand that that was the love they had for them. That's a great point. That's a great point. I put it on the It's got to work that they put in control. Control for? It's ideal to turn it over for peace. Yeah, okay. Let the it's ideal to turn it over so Oh, I see. Let the peace of Christ control. about that. If, if uh, forgiving one another, whoever has a complaint against anyone, right, that's peaceable. Now, verse 16 talks something else. It says, let the word of Christ do what? Rule in your hearts, what you're saying? What verse are you on? 16. 16? 16? Yes. Okay. Dwell in your heart. So the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Remember what Dale said a while ago at the end of verse 15? And be ye thankful. Be ye thankful for what? For that peace. Be thankful that God gives you that peace. Let his word richly dwell within you. With all wisdom, teaching and admonishing. Now, does that say with all Bible intelligence? Does that say that you have to know every single thing about the Bible to teach someone or admonish someone? There's a difference between intelligence and wisdom. Would you agree? I can... I can be smart with figures or recall words, you know, maybe have a big vocabulary where somebody thinks, oh, he, may, he must be smart. But what's it mean to be wise? Because this is what it says. To use what to use? To use it. To use it. Yes. That's right. To use it. Knowing things doesn't make a person wise. It may make them smart, but it doesn't make them wise. Using that, right, and able to understand that, and also able to teach that shows wisdom. Right? Discernment. Discerning things that someone tells you. You tell me something, and I'm going to discern what you mean. Well, you have to use wisdom to do that. Well, let's give a good definition. Singing is the heart of speech. Now, we noticed last week in Ephesians 5 and 18 and 20 that where it was injected right in that part of the scripture and teaching where wine was not to influence you when you were singing. Okay, now when you sing, that's the heart of speech. It's speaking to God. Whenever I say, O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder, that should be coming from the heart, and I should mean it. For this, for what he's saying here, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. Yeah. Not influenced by anything. Not influenced by an instrument. Not influenced by, by lines, as it was in Ephesians 5. So it's the heart that when you sing these words that are scriptural, that's your heart speaking to God. And it, it should have meaning to instead of just calling words. Yes. You know, the songs that we sing today may not resemble the songs that were sung in the first century. Or psalms. You remember the psalms are those were songs in a way that were recitations sometimes of, of the prior teachings, right? Of God's word. Well that's however it was, it was words given homage to something. And then this something is saying, it tells you point blank, to God. That's how we sing. That's what our psalms are. That's what our admonitions are. Because it's not, we're doing that to God, but does it have an effect on each other? Does my singing or not singing affect you? Yes. 
Yes, it does. And how we know that? One another. Right. And admonishing one another, teaching and admonishing one another. Right. That means when I'm singing thankfulness to God amongst brethren, does that mean I'm also teaching and admonishing each other? That's what it means. Doesn't it? When I admonish, so I recognize. Yeah. I recognize is there an importance to that? about this verse. Verse 17. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. All right, this is back so much Paul's comment. In whatever we do in word or deed, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is a that is a significant toll on someone to it's not a burden um, but I'm saying it is a uh, it is something that must be revered when we do speak or act because everything that we say or do should be done then in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, if we can't say that the Lord Jesus would approve of what we are saying or doing, then we can assume then that what we're doing is not in the name of the Lord Jesus. By therefore, it is not giving thanks through Jesus to God the Father. through him. 
Except through Christ the Son, according to the scriptures that we've read. So, in essence, then, when we sing and pray our praises to God, we are singing them through Jesus and basically to Jesus, right? Since He is God. And it says there, we've stayed in our Colossians uh, study talking about who Christ was. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn. And by Him all things were created. That's who we're singing to. That's who we're singing through. Because we won't know God the Father without knowing God the Son. In the same way, I think a lot of people do Second habit by this one that is saying it, but it's a human when we pray. Couldn't approach in our simple, old self build approach would be short now. Correct. It, it's, that is the only one. Correct. He is the propitiation, right, of those sins, which gives us then the uh, access to God through Him. All right. King James says, Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. So your version says, Through. Uh, no, mine says, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him. So it's the next part. Did you mine have that? Says giving thanks to God. To God. Okay. Mine says giving thanks to God, but it also says through him. Yours too? Yours too. What's your opinion? All right. Verse 18. Now, when we talk about this next part here, I want us to think about this with... An open mind, considering all the things that we just read about our hearts being filled with these things. Right? The things they talked about. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, forgiveness, love. Those are the things now that are going to be applied in relationships. And that's what he's going to talk about. Right? And we're going to put off those earthly body things, immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, in all forms of idolatry, put away anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech, and lying. Those are the things we're going to put off. We're going to put those the other things on in these relationships. And the first one, wives, be subject to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Wives, 
be subject to your husband as to the Lord. In verse 23, as Christ also, the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives to their husbands and everything. Now in verse 25, he gives a, he gives a lesson to the husbands. Just like you will hear in a minute. Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Verse 19 in Colossians 3. Husbands, love your, love your wives and do not be embittered against them. So those two passages, as Christ loved the church and not bitter, embittered against them. Is there any Think of the relationship between Christ and the church. He was the head, wasn't he? What did Christ do when he was on earth? He died for the church. Did he serve others? He was the ultimate example of a servant, right? But he was God. So, were people, were people I mean... Uh, Lavishing the, the kissing his feet and and kissing his rings and was that what Christ was doing while he was on the earth? He brought salvation to mankind. He did. As a lamb, right? As a lamb. Now, husbands, act like that. That you would die for your wife. No question. Right? Christ didn't question. He didn't question whether or not he was going to fulfill his father's will. He was obedient to his father. Wasn't he? Christ loved the church so much that he died for it. Now, can you love your wife so much that you would die for her? Put your love blood between her blood. No harm come to her. I shouldn't guess. I think so. And we should. Christ said. Yeah. I thought about that a lot. Right. There's no greater love than doing to what? Yeah. To lay down his own life. You know, they say you die for your wife or family member, maybe even a close friend, somebody down the road. Yeah. And what affords that, you think? Is it courage? Or is it peace? That's the peace, I think, I'm talking about. Christ, that you could lay your life down for someone. Why? Jared mentioned it last week in his, in his uh, invitation. Didn't he? He said he was talking about the fellow who never was afraid about dying. He was peaceful. He had peace. And that's what we have here. What does this end of Lord? Anybody have any comments about that? God's will. You have the right to be there. 
and has a right to be there. Not to say that a person can be so domineering as to uh, subject their wife to doing things against God's will. Right? In godly things, it's saying, wives, be subject to your husband. Let me tell you a little bit. I've told this here before, but the uh, no situation that I was involved in, certainly a husband should be, should consider his wife's opinion and thinking about it. It was at a Bible class. And this woman, I mean, she got up on her tiptoes. I guess it's something that had freshly happened that day of the week. But her husband, he wasn't there. He was teaching class. Uh, her husband had was wanting to buy a little piece of land or something. And she said, and she really got up and said, no. she said, not over my dead body. I said, I said, just settle down and let me talk to you. I said, he does have a right to make a decision in that mind because he is in my house. And I said, the best thing that you could do would be to pray for him that he would do the right thing and make the right decision. That's, uh, to say that, that a man doesn't have a right to make the decision in the home, that's wrong. If that's not big, he does have the right to make the final decision. Don't need to be dominating over it. And I have known too many men that's been like that. Uh, that when I told her that, she didn't say a thing. But think of it. I was going to say, I, you know, this might sound kind of prejudiced, but when you think of a marriage, <clears throat> and I think of a team, but I don't think of, I think of like a horse team. You got both of them pulling together, but one's a leap. One's got to make it, one is taking direction as to which way to go from the one that's steering the reins. And so someone's got to be a leap, regardless of any situation. I mean, we've all heard the, the expression, too many sheets, not enough many. You can see that happen um, on the non work situation. Somebody has to take the leap and become a spiritual aspect. Obviously, God's are, but the husband's supposed to take the leap. Lord and pass it on down to the ranks for lack of a better term. But uh, and, and but that's one of the things that's lacking today in the day and time. You go, well, watch that trauma. Who's the one that's the trauma to leave with the father? He's not looked at as a leader. He's not looking at this obviously not spiritual leader in Hollywood frame. Or but even in the house. The father's not looked at uh, ever since leaving the beaver, he's not looked at as as the leader, and that's what's lost. It, Day and day and time because men aren't taught to be leaders, they're just taught to be there. And that, that's the sad truth of it. Does that devalue the wife in any way? There's nothing here that's devaluing to the wife's role in, in any way. I like a king to a first officer of the ship. Captain is very good. Captain is the main man. Captain makes the, the call. He relies on the first officer every step of the way. He can't do his job. <coughs> yeah. right. Okay, that's right. Go ahead, Tristan. If we <clears throat> devalue the, the wife position, if she thinks that or we think that, then we would have to think the same thing about the church. That's because right. we're the wife. That's right. Or we're the bride. Correct. And we need to know our role. Correct. see that in sports. Uh, if you have two teams and one team we were talking about the other night, if they fight among each other, they no longer need to separate each other. Husband and wife complement each other and the goal is to reach heaven and fight when two against one, two beat one. Remember, we are here to make it to heaven, so we fighting against sin and our adversary. So it takes two. If one falls, the other one will get to them up so we are a team. But we gotta keep that so no one is better than the other one. Yes, one has to be the leader and call out the shot. But 
in order we have to be in the way that these balance as to not be the other person. Yeah. And you think about these things, and even in the situation we talk, these kind of things come up, I'm sure, a lot. But if these, if, if the teachings here in verse 12, right, are to be a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, I would venture to say if this problem was coming up, there were some more problems that had probably come up before, and these things weren't in their heart. I would say so. That's human nature. It is. But it can cause big problems. Well, I didn't realize how many times in here with that he says to love your wife. And I know we were mentioned it, but it, it tell me, love your wife, love your wife. Love your wife. <laughs> I didn't realize that that's been there that many times. Yes. Yes, that's right. Um, and, and thinking about that very thing, what did he say was beyond all things? And beyond all things, what? Put on love. Put on love. And then what's he tell his husbands to do? Huh? Love your wives. And do not be embittered against them. I mean, that, that word charity, that actually means the act. The act of love. It's a little better rendition, I think, to give the word love to our charity. That is actually the act. You're involved in it. And you're involved in it because you love it. Yes. Is there any is there any attitude that Christ ever bestowed on the church that was ugly or domineering or uh, superior attitude no so when we think about these types of things we're talking about think about Christ's attitude towards you everybody in the church and that's the attitude that the husbands and wives should have all right he's yourself no compromise either what's that they ain't no compromise I mean he's rule is rule God said something, that's the way it is, you know. And as long as it's fit the Lord, that's the way it is, so there's no compromise. We can't come in there and just because we don't like something, change it. You know, right. It's, it's set there and be there. <laughs> that's right. It's a great point. Yeah, so we talked about the uh, comments made about the wives' situation, what they have to submit to the husband. And you had that example in Samuel. When when Nabal, when he was married to married to Abigail, she had to serve with him and she prayed for him. But she told David when he came and he ran David's people off, she said his name was school and he's a foolish man. But she still prayed for him and wanted the best for him. Still with him. So sometimes we do foolish things, even as husbands, yeah. that our wives know. And we have to work with that. We have to trying to work together, just as uh, Caleb talked about a you know, first mate and a captain, where they might have a disagreement, and they have to work together and work through. There's things we learn and work from, it's kind of our place there in life when we work together. It's trying to be make one another better. Right. You know, man, you got the right to say, I guess, like Dale said, but still, they don't mean they're always right. <laughs> now then, you know, and we might be in our thinking, but not maybe for the right thing, like Bill said about the man, you know. The man may not be exactly right, that's why you've got to help make it, you know, kind of talk things over something. That's right. And if, if both have these same things here that we talked about, because he laid them out for us for this very reason. He laid them out to say a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. If we go by our decision making, and our respect for each other, having these things, those other things really aren't going to matter. Uh, there's 
there's so much in today's culture where women are trying to like become equal to men, but we're not, we weren't made like that. We each have our own role that we have to partake in. And in today's society, it's like, we forgot about that. And I think that would go both ways. In today's society, right's wrong and wrong is right. Up is down and down is up. But that's a great point. But, but I don't want us to consider these passages as a devaluing of the wife. If anything, it's uplifting as a wife. Because we're supposed to, a wife is supposed to be loved as Christ loved the church. And we always think about this in the negative. We don't. But sometimes we always think about it in the negative. You know, what's it mean to the wife? Well, think of it. What's it mean to the husband? Love and respect. What's it mean to the wife? Love and respect. Well, you're one after you're married anyway. You ain't two no more. I mean, you, you're one. That's right. Just like Christ and the church is I mean, you keep your head. But it's still one. I mean, if you're in the church, you're in Christ. If you're in Christ, you're in the church, you should be, you know. I mean, it's like a man and wife. And you're, you're one. Right. Without Christ, there is no church. Right. Right. And. Don't forgive us. And without a church, there was no Christ. It would all be a farce and a lie. He accomplished his purpose. Yeah. He did. All right. Children, obey your, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not exasperate your children, that they may not lose heart. That's that point. So, it says, children, be obedient to your parents in all things, but fathers, do not exacerbate, exasperate your children. Do you see what's going on there? It's like a tug of war, right? It's a tug of war where the parents are pull, 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 push, push, push. It's saying there, don't do that. I mean, don't pick and pick and pick at your kids to where they lose heart. What are they going to lose heart of? Discouraged. Discouraged. As yeah, right. All right, we'll pick up and finish chapter three next week. And mine.